Hey, well, welcome everyone to our the second of our uh, speaker series events for Black History Month at the Jack Hadley Black History Museum. Um, uh, I am Tom Aiello, a professor of history and Africana studies at Valdosta State. Um, uh, we had a, 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 a great talk last week. I know we're gonna have a great one this week. Um, tonight, our speaker is Dr. Cheryl E. Mango, an assistant professor of history at Virginia State University. She received national recognition for creating the first HBCU history course at Virginia State. MSN, Diverse Issues in Higher Education, HBCU Digest, and several networks, uh, among other media outlets, have featured her work on Black colleges. She's also the founding creator of the HBCU, HBCU Studies Academic Discipline. She provides uh, the philosophical and practical basis for HBCU Studies in her upcoming article in DICAN, Black College Renaissance, my decision to create the first HBCU history course and 2020 proposal for interdisciplinary HBCU studies curriculums in mass. Dr. Mango completed her undergraduate degrees uh, in history and political science uh, at Grambling State in Louisiana and her master's degree in history at Louisiana Tech, two places that are very uh, near and dear to my heart. In 2016, she received her PhD in history at Morgan State University with concentrations in African-American, African diasporan, and 20th century U.S. history. While a doctoral student, she interned at the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges and Universities in Washington, D.C. during the Obama administration, which helped to shape her research specializations. Dr. Mango's research interests concern HBCU, HBCU systems analysis more broadly, and in particular, Black college innovation, functionality, and sustainability, American presidents' relationship with Black colleges, and the history of federal and private funding to HBCUs. One of her latest publications focuses on Black colleges and the American presidency. It's titled The HBCU Revolution, Desegregation, Disintegration, Collaboration, and Jimmy Carter's 1980 decision to give Black colleges their own White House office. The article is scheduled for upcoming publication in the Journal of Federal History, so please be on the lookout for that. Dr. Mango credits the opportunities her parents' HBCU education provided to her family for driving her own professional dedication to the institutions. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Cheryl Mango. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Elio. Uh, it's a great privilege and an honor. I mean, I'm almost in tears just hearing that because studying um, the African-American experience and also being living it is oftentimes psychologically uh, taxing. Um, but not necessarily in a negative way, but in an inspirational way. And when I hear what I was able to achieve as a result of historically black colleges, it, it reminds me of what these schools have done for pretty much the entire spectrum of African Americans in this nation. These schools are what I call evolutionary institutions. Uh, formulated specifically for turning the formerly enslaved into the African-American population. Uh, that task is not a small task, that is a very large task. And no other set of schools in the world, I argue, have had the task of turning a formerly enslaved population into a thriving professional class of African-Americans, a proud class. We did it in style, made it look easy of African-Americans, of, of people um, uh, in the world. So on that note, uh, my comments tonight will be brief um, uh, uh, in the sense that uh, I know that it's a Saturday night and I, I know that it's Super Bowl Sunday and I know you got your, everybody has their, their hors d'oeuvres marinating at this time. However, before I begin, I would like to thank the Jack 
Haley Museum. And I'm just honored that he's here today. And I was able to speak with this pioneer who is leaving a legacy uh, for our community. See, this is a, a, a revolutionary act to be able to even study our history. A part of slavery was the erasure, the systematic erasure of our history, of our memory. So as historians and what we do when we come to commemorate our history every month or uh, every year, what we're doing is we're trying to remember, we're trying to reclaim, we are trying to recover what was lost. See, a slave had to be made and one of the ways that a slave was made was through the total, uh, an attempt to totally erase a memory of, of, of the legacy of who you were uh, prior to uh, what the identity and culture that was imposed upon you. So thank you uh, to the Jack Haley Museum and Mr. Haley himself uh, for what you've been able to create. And um, thank you for that great introduction uh, of myself. Um, yes, I am a proud HBCU product. Um, I realized early on as a, a student, as a young girl in, in, in South Louisiana, growing up, uh, my parents had me a bit later in life, so they were of the civil rights generation. And they would often tell me, Cheryl, you know, if it wasn't for H, if it wasn't for Gremlin and Southern, which are our, our primary uh, public HBCUs in, in Louisiana, they said we couldn't, have, we wouldn't have had, had an ability to get an education. Um, LSU would not let us in. Louisiana Tech, where I graduated with my master's degree, would not allow us in. Um, and you know that always resonated with me. I always thought about. Uh, the poverty that I saw, that I knew that my parents came from. Um, hearing stories of my mother's family. Uh, she was the oldest of 10 kids and they have, them having to sell the milk cow so she could attend Gremlin. And how significant that milk cow was to their survival. Nevertheless, she was able to go to Gremlin and, and become a uh, a professional, uh, an educator, a politician, a businesswoman. And similarly, my father coming from uh, childhood poverty of six boys, all of them successful. Uh, my father able to get a scholarship from the legendary coach, Eddie Robinson, um, to go play football at Grambling State University and then be able to be drafted. He went to the NFL, someone who came from poverty, uh, able to go to the NFL because he was granted a football scholarship from a historically black college, who went on to become the first black person uh, in the National Guard in Alabama, actually, um, as well as an, a, a prominent businessman in Louisiana, a prominent politician, uh, a prominent educator, so many things. And my story is, is, is not unique. Uh, my story is the story of so many uh, Black people who uh, would not have had the opportunity to receive an education if it had not been for our mighty historically Black colleges and universities. And though they are not perfect, and, and I in HBCU studies and me being the creator of the academic discipline, HBCU studies, and, and the pioneer of, of the study of the HBCU uh, uh, on a systematic basis, on a, on a K through 12 to university to public basis, um, I know that to take HBCU serious, that does not mean to talk about them as if they are perfect institutions because they are not. However, my story, I would not be sitting here. Black people would probably still be illiterate if it were not for what these schools were able to provide and continue to provide. I know that now because of HBCUs, we and I'll get into that later, uh, we're able to go to our predominantly white institutions and we're able to look at our HBCUs and say that they have inferior, we have inferior uh, facilities. 
they might say that we have inferior uh, uh, athletic programs now that uh, uh, a certain type of historical amnesia has occurred uh, where we have forgotten uh, that at one point in time, you know, LSU wouldn't even play Grambling. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? That LSU wouldn't football, wouldn't even play Grambling because, uh, I don't know, some people say because they knew they would have lost or maybe it was just because of the racism. I'm not sure, but I, I know that it's interesting now living and existing in, in 2020 and what's called year 2020. Um, and the, the comparisons between PWIs and HBCUs, I believe are unfair. I believe that they do not take into consideration the full his, history of historically black colleges. But nevertheless, um, it was important for me to be able to further these institutions because of their commitment to, his, to the African-American community. Uh, they have single-handedly, I argue, uh, put the African-American community on their backs to bring us to where we are today. And, and therefore, I, I'm proud to be a, inherently an HBCU product. Uh, not only do I work at an HBCU, uh, I was trained at two HBCUs. I received my PhD, which and from an HBCU, Morgan State University in Baltimore, and that was a conscious decision. I didn't choose to uh, go to an HBCU for my PhD because I couldn't get in anywhere else. It was a conscious decision to demonstrate the productive possibilities of HBCUs. But nevertheless, um, it pains me to say that uh, there are some limitations to my talk today uh, because unfortunately, um, you know, being, a, uh, being able, being, creating new uh, thoughts and ideas oftentimes can come with some, 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 some unfortunate consequences. And, you know, I've been the victim of so much academic theft that I, I'm, I, I'm limited in, in, in what I can offer in terms of my research today. However, I will present to you an overview of why I call HBCUs a, a great American story. See, this is a great American story. This is, is, is a great American story in the sense that uh, when we think of a great American story, we think of, of triumph. We think of perseverance, we think of overcoming, we think of pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. And, and believe me, HBCUs epitomize uh, that conservative ideology because of the, the discri discrimination and inequities in funding that they received over the, the years. It's amazing that they were able to do and continue to do what they have done with so few resources. I can only imagine what they would have been able to create had they been given the same amount of resources as predominantly white institutions. Um, but nevertheless, this is a, a, a great American story. Um, and, and so I wanna just briefly discuss uh, some highlights. I wanna point out about seven highlights from HBCU history that I would like for you to consider. And after these highlights, um, I would be open to uh, uh, some question and answers should any arise. But nevertheless, um, when we think of HBCU history, I think oftentimes, and I think this is a fallacy uh, in, in African-American history in general, and I know that it's a consequence of uh, uh, the, ensla the enslavement of, of, of Black people, uh, but we fail to oftentimes place uh, African-American history, uh, uh, we failed to start with Africa. <laughs> um, and, and we started with slavery. And, and what usually starts, uh, when I hear discussions of HBCUs, people usually started with slavery, but I, I'm a bit different. Uh, I argue that, um, that it's important when we look at HBCU history that we see them first as evolutionary schools, just as uh, uh, just as scientists say that, that humanity evolved on the African continent, that uh, Black people are responsible 
for creating other human beings. I argue that HBCUs are similarly evolutionary institutions in the sense that uh, they were able to single-handedly uh, turn the formerly enslaved population into African Americans. That that's not uh, that's not something that we should look lightly at. Um, oftentimes in movies, we hear how uh, emulations and of how slaves are the enslaved supposedly talked. And I thought, I think it's a beautiful language, the language that the, uh, my enslaved ancestors talk. Cause it, it was very difficult to uh, come up with a language and uh, be a, have a language imposed upon you uh, different from the language that you were used to speaking. Um, but nevertheless, uh, today, we don't really hear that as much anymore, um, and a large part of that, uh, I argue, is due to what HBCUs were able to do in terms of, uh, of, of moving African Americans to a place of competitiveness uh, uh, in mainstream society. So when I say that they're evolutionary institutions, uh, that's just one area that uh, we can point to, but it's so many areas uh, that HBCUs uh, were able to do in terms of moving uh, Black people to a point of, of competitiveness in mainstream American society uh, after being bound uh, for uh, over a hundred years and, 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 able, and with an inability to compete. So uh, I would also uh, like for you to think about HBCUs within the context of, of, of African history in the sense that HBCUs are actually connected to the first education system. The same people who created the first education system are the same people who were educated and, and lead HBCUs. The first education system emerged in Africa with the first human beings. Um, so uh, education was not foreign to uh, African-Americans. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, it was their ancestors who created the first education system in the world, uh, being the first humans in the world. So, um, and as a part of that, they created the first education system in the world. Um, so when we look at HBCUs, um, I guess the point that I'm trying to say here is let's not just look at them as institutions that emerged out of slavery, that they have a very long history, um, that it's important that we connect them to this long history and we connect them to uh, the first education system in the world. And it's a lot of, of global connections that, uh, uh, that I can make and that I tend to make when it comes to HBCU history and how we think about HBCU history. Um, uh, it's so many ways that HBCU history intersects with not just African-American and American history, but with global events, uh, with global events, uh, even prior to their, the first one being founded. And one of them being the example that I just gave in the sense that HBCUs uh, uh, are emerged that they are from the set the lineage they have the they are made up of the lineage uh, of the first people the people who created the first education system on earth in Africa and um, we could get into uh, a lot if you were to take my African history classes I could show you uh, and pinpoint exactly uh, with the rise of the African educational systems over the course of, of history uh, but that's, that's, that's one of the, the second major point that I wanted to discuss when it comes to uh, HBCU history. Uh, thirdly, um, I wanted to pinpoint another point that we often overlook when we look at HBCUs. Um, HBCUs were actually uh, around and during slavery. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had four HBCUs that existed while slavery existed. Um, Cheney, uh, Wilberforce, Lincoln, and the University of the District of Columbia. Now, what's interesting about these four institutions is that not one of them exists in the Deep South. 
Why is that? Why is it that, you know, now the majority of HBCUs exist in the Deep South, but why is it that not one HBCU that existed during slavery was able to exist in the Deep South? Well, it's, it's quite simple because it would have been illegal uh, due to the anti-literacy laws. Just the mere existence of an educated Black person would have been an illegal proposition. That could have meant death. That could have been death if uh, HBCU actually existed in the South during slavery and you had Black people in there, in the schools, actually uh, receiving an education. That could have potentially meant imprisonment or death because it was illegal for Black people. We had laws, anti-literacy laws. It was elite. We hear this all the time. We know this. But in terms of how we integrate this knowledge into the knowledge of uh, our knowledge of HBCUs, uh, we often overlook that, that it would have been uh, illegal. Uh, just the, uh, the idea of Black people sitting there being educated, that would have been against the law. So that's why people say that the, the, the language of the enslaved was an act. We call that the Sambo characteristic uh, in uh, history for my historians. And they say that the enslaved had to act that way. We literally had to act a certain way so we wouldn't be appear as if we were educated and smart. So the whole idea of the HBCU was antithetical to that proposition. So as such, it would have been uh, uh, impossible at that time. It would have been dangerous. Uh, and it would have been illegal for an HBCU to exist uh, during slavery. That would have been illegal. So um, it's quite interesting that um, HB, the first HBCUs uh, existed during slavery. However, not one of them uh, existed in the Deep South where the majority of them exist now uh, because, as I mentioned, that would have been illegal. Now, as we look at another period of HBCUs, let's look at HBCUs after the end of the Civil War. So this is the fourth point that I want to discuss. Now, after the end of the Civil War, uh, it's believed that about 90% of Black people were illiterate, meaning uh, they could not read and write. And when I look at, and when I teach HBCU history, and we, when we look at the history of Black education, the number one thing, and this, this is what I really try to drive home with my students at HBCUs. Uh, if I see a student uh, not turning in work or something to that effect, it really bothers me because I know that it was, that that was the goal. The goal was for us not to read and write. That I know that the path to being in a position where we're actually able to even investigate our own history, that this is an evolutionary, a revolutionary act, considering our experience. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's believed that, in a, and it's a great book um, by Bobby T. Lovett, who wrote one of the foundational books on HBCU history. Uh, HBCU, Historical Black Colleges, a narrative history. That's one of the foundational books and one of the great books that have driven my, uh, my ability to teach and study HBCU history. So I encourage you to study that. Along with uh, Jelani Favors' book, um, uh, Shelter in a Time of a Storm, how HBCU fostered uh, 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 political activism. So these are some some really um, tantamount works in our in our uh, in the field of HBCU history, which is a rising discipline. And I'm happy to be a, amongst those who are are pioneering the study of the HBCU. Uh, but nevertheless, let's think about this: ninety percent illiteracy rate uh, at the end of the Civil War. Ninety percent of Black people could not read or write. And in a 40 year period, HBCU single-handedly with limited funds and Jim Crow segregation, single-handedly turned that statistic around. In a 40 year period, 
And this is why I say that these are evolutionary schools. That's not something that we should just take lightly. A 90% illiteracy rate able to be reversed in, in a 40 year period. And what did that reversal lead to? Well, let's look at another period in HBCU history. It led to something that we know now as the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance. See, if it was not for HBCUs uh, creating the safe space, creating the space uh, for Black people to receive an education, because even if someone was not educated at an HBCU, their teacher was likely educated at an HBCU. And so HBCUs had a, a sunburst effect on the Black community. And so uh, HBCUs were able to uh, turn that 90% illiteracy rate around. And what usually happens when you emerge out of a dark age is you have a renaissance. This is why I call and I have termed uh, and coined this era in, in my writings, the era of the HBCU renaissance. I argue that this is now the HBCU Renaissance. And what's significant about that is most people don't say, hi, we're in the Renaissance right now. Is you, we usually wait for historians to come back and say, that was a Renaissance, that was a dark age. Uh, that's a pejorative term, but, but the Harlem Renaissance, during the Harlem Renaissance, they didn't say we're writing because right now we're in the Harlem Renaissance. So what I'm trying to do is right now, and that's a part of HBCU studies, which I'll get to. Right now, I want us to see this as an HBCU renaissance. So what do we do with that renaissance? And I'll get back to that. But moving forward to the 1920s, um, after HBCUs were able to turn that illiteracy rate around, that allowed us to create what's often called the new Negro was created. And, and what do we mean by this term, the new Negro? What are the characteristics of the new Negro? But I ask what allowed for the creation of the new Negro. And I argue it's the HBCU. See, it wasn't just the writers uh, in the HBCU, I mean, in the Harlem Renaissance that were uh, educated at HBCUs. And then HBCUs providing a safe space for that, to learn how to uh, grapple with the realities and, and think in depthly about the realities of the African-American experience. But it was that HBCUs had instruments and, and, and safe spaces uh, for Black people to learn how to formally play these new instruments, these pianos and trumpets and saxophones that our musical programs had and have. Uh, that also allowed for the creation of jazz and all of these other various aspects that we associate with the Renaissance period uh, of the African-American experience. And then if we move forward to uh, the civil rights movement, HBCUs were also central uh, in that movement. Uh, most of your civil rights activists, some of the most prominent were educated at HBCUs, but it's unfortunate that during Black History Month that we rarely celebrate HBCUs. Uh, I, I remember walking through the hallways during Black History Month uh, and I would see posters about Martin Luther King and Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, but what was missing from that uh, was, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, was an acknowledgement that they did, they, they got their start and their ideas were shaped by HBCUs. See, HBCUs are missing from the historical narrative of the African-American experience. And so my goal and the part of the goal with HBCU studies is to centralize HBCUs as a central actor, not just somebody, not just schools we cheer on, uh, like they're we're at a pep rally and say, oh, you went there, I went there too. Oh, I like this school, I like they band. No, it's time for us to take HBCU serious and move them to the center of African-American history and the center of American history where they belong. Uh, as such, uh, going back to HBCUs and the uh, uh, civil rights movement. See, it wasn't just the, uh, 
the actors in the silver, the prominent actors in the civil rights movement. It wasn't just the protests uh, that HBCU students led uh, from North Carolina and Baltimore and all over, Southern, all over in Louisiana. Um, it wasn't just that uh, Booker T. Washington and and um, it was. Uh, uh, well, Martin, Dr. King, and 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 W. E. B. Du Bois, uh, and so many of our other of our prominent uh, civil rights uh, uh, progenitors, uh, uh, from what all was able to be accomplished from Howard's Law School, challenging uh, the, uh, the being used as a, a template. Uh, for challenging, legally challenging discrimination in Jim Crow and, and causing Jim Crow to crumble. It wasn't that just that HBCUs caused that or led to uh, the, the demise of, of Jim Crow, although racism still exists and although white supremacy and discrimination still exist uh, and, and still exist that. But it was that their professors, oftentimes the professors are overlooked. It was many writers, it was many great professors at HBCUs who trained the minds of the Dr. Kings, of the W.B. Du Boises when he was at Fisk. It was a lot of professors that, uh, that we need, like Horace Mann, Bond, and, and even Mary McLeod Bethune, and Benjamin Mays, and so many great professors and leaders at HBCUs that we don't hear a lot about who, were actually instrumental in encouraging their students and giving their students the uh, ability and the and pointing, putting the dots together for their students to uh, go on to be progenitors and, and fighters in the civil rights movement, which led to a global, uh, a global demise of, of colonization and dem discrimination in other places. HBCUs basically laid the context. Uh, for human rights, uh, they provided. They were the really the only safe space uh, for non a, a, a conglomerate safe space for non-white people in the globe to be able to uh, think of uh, about their impression about their oppression in the ways that they did. So uh, moving forward uh, to HBCUs in 1980, which is one of my my area of specialty. I'm the only person. Who has written uh, as my as they read in my bio? I was honored to intern at the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges and um, during the Obama administration. Many people are just now realizing that HBCUs have their own White House office, and I never could imagine that when I was there in 2013 and 2014, uh, 2015 that. And then I became, that was, that's my research topic. Um, that's what I wrote my dissertation on. That's what my book is coming out on. That's what one of my journal articles is about. The history of how HBCUs received their own White House office. But I never imagined at that time that HBCUs would move to a Renaissance period. Because at that time, HBCUs were really struggling. Uh, we can look at the history of HBCUs, um, and it's really amazing that right now HBCUs have emerged as uh, in their Renaissance period. And um, it's many arguments that could be made as to why, and I and I have my own interpretations as to why I believe now HBCUs are in a Black college Renaissance. Um, but nevertheless. In 1980, Jimmy Carter created the White House Initiative on HBCUs. And people don't understand that HBCUs were the first set of institutions to receive their own White House office. They were the first set of institutions of any inst schools in the world, I mean, any schools in America to receive their own White House office. Um, and um, when it comes to the history of HBCUs receiving their own White House office, uh, it's important to note that Jimmy Carter didn't give HBCUs their own White House office just because he was a nice man or a nice Democrat or a nice man or a lot of things that we uh, oftentimes like to associate based upon our political interpretation. But instead that it was 
the HBCU community that had actually um, strategized to get HBCUs their own White House office. As a matter of fact, Jimmy Carter at that time had the most Black graduates, uh, the most Black people in his administration that working in, that had ever worked in the White House administration. And the majority of them, the overwhelming majority of them were HBCU graduates. And so they were very much committed to ensuring that their schools could exist long-term. And they did that. And, and that came in the form of their own White House office. So moving, and I, and I argue that as a result of that, HBCUs went into another uh, Renaissance period. Um, and, and we can see that, you know, oftentimes we can connect that to a lot of ways that HBCUs were celebrated after the 1980s. But nevertheless, as we move that, my last point today, um, HBCUs are finally getting the recognition that they deserve. And I'm so happy for that. I mean, it's just really an honor and a privilege to be an HBCU graduate, uh, to be the child of, of HBCU parents. It's really an honor and a privilege to work at an HBCU, knowing that these are the only set of institutions in America that have never discriminated against um, anyone. Well, we do have, that is a nuanced argument because unfortunately we did discriminate against darker skinned uh, black people. We did have that uh, in, our, in our schools. But HBCUs never existed to exclude white people. Um, and so oftentimes today I hear critiques about HBCUs about uh, their existence and what their existence means. And, and I argue that um, it's important to understand that uh, HBCUs did not come to exist uh, because Black people were trying to exclude themselves from anyone, that this is what uh, the society had created. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure if HBCUs have received, and, I, and this is where it gets um, murky at, but I'm not sure if uh, uh, HBCUs have received the redress that they deserve. The redress, it's not, it's, it's, it's a challenge. You know, it's, it's not a, you have to be committed. You have to be committed as a faculty member. You have to want to work at an HBCU. You have to see the bigger picture because we don't have the same salaries uh, that uh, predominantly white institution faculty have. We don't have the same access to certain opportunities uh, that, and, and the same goals for our students and the same goals historically. But we know that it's a bigger picture. We know that we don't have the legacy of racism and discrimination uh, and, 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 and theft and slavery and enslavement that many of these white institutions have. We don't have that. Our legacy, we're proud of our history. It's not something in our history that we have to hide. Many institutions have to hide their history. They're apologizing for their history. But HBCUs don't have to apologize for their history. It's one of the few sets of institutions in America who do not have to apologize for their history. And that's very rare because most institutions in America have to apologize for their history. But HBCUs don't have to apologize for their history. So that brings me to where we are today and how I created HBCU history uh, on a, the study of HBCU history uh, on an institutional level. I created that because I knew that we did not have to apologize for our history. I knew that it was time for Black people to have the tools that we needed to be unapologetic about our history. We don't have to apologize for our inferior, quote unquote, institutions. We don't have to, we can say that, the, that we don't have the same institutions because of the racism, because of the discrimination, because of the history. So the question is, what do we do with that? How do we do it? And that's why 
I created the HBCU studies academic discipline. So we can study these institutions. So we don't just have to think about them and, and talk about them uh, based upon our football rivers, our rivalries and the bands that we like. I'm not saying that it's anything, it's nothing wrong with that, but it's now time for us to study them more in depthly. It's time for us to study them systematically. It's time for us to move them to the center of African-American in the center of American history, in the center of world history. And the only way that we can do that is through the systematic study of HBCUs, hence uh, through what I term the HBCU studies academic discipline, which is why I call for the study of HBCUs in the K through 12 curriculums. I call for the study of HBCUs, not just uh, in the history department at Virginia State, but in every department, at every university. I believe that every university can create one specific history class, I mean, one specific class as it relates to HBCUs because HBCUs are a laboratory of learning. They offer a lot to, not only do they offer a lot when we study them, okay, because they've been able to create so much, uh, it's not a lot of lessons that can be learned from studying HBCUs. We can learn how to diversify the workforce uh, through the study of HBCUs. We can learn how people are, are able to overcome from oppressive conditions. We are able to learn how Black people are able to rule themselves and govern themselves because we have presidents, we have uh, uh, police stations, we have libraries, we have everything that you would need to govern yourself at an HBCU. We have that on our campus and we don't have a high crime rate uh, at the, on the HBCU campus. So it's so much that people could be learned uh, from studying the HBCU. So on that note, uh, I would just like to conclude my comments today by reiterating uh, what I have covered. What I want you to leave here today with is a broader understanding uh, of the need uh, to study HBCUs uh, on an intrinsic, critical, scholarly analysis basis, uh, understanding that these institutions are connected to the first human beings on earth based upon uh, the science, what scientists say. That HBCUs emerge out of the first, first education system on earth, but according to scientists and according to archeologists, and according to historians uh, like myself, um, that HBCUs are not uh, rooted in slavery. They are rooted from, uh, from the progenitors, from creators, inventors, scholars, from, from, from warriors, from, from all people from all walks of life who uh, created humanity based upon what scientists say. However, due to anti-literacy laws, the first HBCUs could not legally exist in the South until after the Civil War, which is why we have the first HBCUs existing that existed during slavery, existing uh, in the Northern areas of the United States. Uh, but nevertheless, they were able to teach Black people how to read and write in a 40 year period after the Civil War. Uh, and they were also, I argue single-handedly responsible for the Harlem Renaissance as well as the civil rights movement, uh, articulating freedom globally. Uh, and they became in 1980, the first set of schools to receive their own White House office. And finally, today, they are getting the recognition they deserve through forums like this. So on that note, I would like to again, thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you to the Jack Haley Museum, African American Museum, for what you all are doing. And thank you so much for this invitation to speak on what I, my savior, one of my, one of my saviors, <laughs> historically black colleges, because without them, you would not be looking at me today. I am a product, a proud product of a historically black college, Bramlin State University and Morgan State University. And just like me, it's so many Black people who were able, and we talk about uh, all of the famous HBCU alums, but it's so many people who are not famous, who have a similar story. 
So on that note, I would just like to conclude and say thank you all for attending and encourage you all to foment the study of the HBCU on so many levels at your church, uh, in your K through 12 classrooms, in your universities, in your social organizations, and wherever else you might gather. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mango. That was great. Um, I, uh, being somebody who has done a lot of work with HBCUs, have tons of questions, but I want to open it up to the floor to see if any of you have any questions for Dr. Mango about her wonderful talk. Well, I, I don't have a question. I have a comment. Uh, sure. The, the, our presenter did a wonderful job of presenting the history of HBCUs. I, for one, haven't ever thought about it from the perspective from which she presented. And to uh, Jack Hatley, I want to congratulate you on what you're doing. Uh, my name is Hiram Spring. I live in Greenville, South Carolina, and I have been spreading the word. And there are at least five other people, I believe, on this Zoom from Greenville. I am spreading the word of your gospel. I am proud to call Thomasville, Georgia, my home, and Jack Hatley, my homeboy. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. That is excellent. Who else has comments or questions? Maybe while you're thinking of them, I'll ask one. Uh, Dr. Mingo, I, um, you know, one of the other things that, that HBCUs kind of started before everybody else was the history of protests on campus and the students in particular protesting against administrations that were incredibly conservative during the 1920s in particular when the Harlem Renaissance was going on about 40 years before white institutions. Um, could, could you talk a little bit about the disconnect between the sometimes between the student body and the faculty and then the administrators? Well, to be honest, um, HBCUs, um, are still trying to move to a place where they have uh, self-determination. These have been very controlled institutions. It was very concerning. It was a, it's a book right here uh, that I, I like to keep by. It's called The White Architects of Black Education. It's the reason why um, uh, uh, Carnegie, so many of uh, Rockefeller, so many whites were very concerned about the education of this newly free black population. They wanted to make sure that it wasn't Malcolm X and, 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 and Marcus Garvey educating these newly free black people. Mm -hmm. It was a fear that uh, these, what do we do with this? It was a concern. What do we do with these newly free uh, blacks. And because of the uh, inequities in funding and, and, and stuff, Black people have, HBCU still to this day have to rely on funding from outside sources. And so that comes with a taste, just like diplomacy. We don't just give our money to nations just for the sake of it. We give it for, to have a measure of control over what goes on in that society. And similarly, HBCUs uh, emerge out of that same context. Uh, one of the costs that they had to pay uh, for uh, whites uh, being able to help fund the schools and uh, allowing them, to, allowing black people to receive an education there was that they had to be extremely, their administrations were controlled. Um, they were very conservative. You don't see a lot of as a matter of fact, I always mention this, it's not one Black or Afrocentric African mascot at an HBCU. We haven't even made it to that phase yet. Uh, I think it might be five HBCUs that's even named after Black people. Most of them are named after whites. Uh, the only, it's only a few HBCUs that's named after Black people. Wilberforce, uh, Bethune, Bethune Cookman, um, uh, Edward Waters, Coppin. It's only a few of them that's even named after Black people. Most of them are named after white and white people. And this represents that control, the, le the, 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 the inability for Black people to be self-determining and have freedom over themselves and freedom over what they learn. 
Uh, so that's where black people had, the students had to stand up and protest against these highly white administrations uh, because it, the wh whites did not believe that black people can run, run institutions. They didn't believe that black people were smart enough and they were afraid. And it was about making sure that black people didn't uh, assimilate it into American society the way that they wanted to as black people to assimilate. And still to this day, we have black HBCUs are very conservative. They are not the, you don't see a lot of Black Lives Matter protests and all of these things going on at HBCU campuses. They are very controlled and they're not very radical. They don't push it a lot. And that's because of the history. If they did, that could mean the demise of Black education, not just at that school for the entire community. So it was, it was, it, it, it was this, this pragmatism that had to come with this kind of dump veiled consciousness that the Du Bois call. And right. we did have students protest against that eventually. That's why you have more black administrations now. But initially that was very rare to find a black ran ran HBCU. Right. Um, we have a we have a question here uh, from Eugene Wilson. He asks, with the recent blow to affirmative action laws dealt by the US Supreme Court to black and brown students trying to enter PWIs. What's your take on the impact to minorities trying to achieve higher education via this avenue, even in light of congressional legislation that directly benefits HBCUs? Well, um, uh, I believe that, um, while I'm not an expert on affirmative action, um, I'm not an expert on the legislation revolving uh, around affirmative action. But I, I will say this as it relates to historically black colleges. You do see uh, a lot of, um, uh, you do see an inverse relationship between um, the, what used to be the black, the black, the, 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 the brightest African Americans were trained at HBCUs. And then with the, uh, with the advent of affirmative action legislation, which was largely conceived. So this is, one of the, this is one of the things that we do in HBCU studies and HBCU history is we critique. We don't just talk about HBCUs from this wonderful place. We critique some of the challenges uh, and, uh, with HBCUs. And one of the, the things that HBCUs, the HBCU community did not get right, I argue. During the civil rights movement, it was not, we weren't overly concerned about the protection of black institutions. And I think that oftentimes that's missing from the affirmative action conversation uh, is, well, what about the, the, what about the black institutions? Should, uh, the, should the smartest, uh, quote unquote, smartest and brightest of the black community uh, enroll into white institutions, what happens to the HBCU? So I think that in answering that question, I would just pause, I would just uh, present, uh, temper my comments uh, based upon that. When I hear that, uh, me as a, a scholar expert on HBCUs, uh, I think of it in that terms. I think of the inverse relationship between uh, affirmative action and historically Black colleges. I'm not saying that that affirmative action should or should not exist. I'm not making any type of political proposition or anything, but I'm looking at the statistics. I'm looking at the research. We, the, the top, if you look at any of the, the brightest and the best and the brightest before integration, they were all trained at HBCUs. And you see that a little bit afterwards with Oprah Renfrey and Spike Lee and just so many others. Uh, but um, we do see that when it's, uh, when when it be when the political conversation becomes overly concerned about uh, blacks uh, being able to get into other institutions, um, that HBCUs, uh, the the interest of HBCUs, the political interest of HBCUs is often not uh, considered. So I would just say that maybe we should also in that conversation consider the political and historical interests of HBCUs without making any, I'm not saying I'm for or against anything. I'm just saying that, that that's where my comments will lead to. No, I think, I think that's a good point. You know, we, we, we rightly celebrate Jackie Robinson for integrating Major League Baseball, but we forget that 
that integration killed the most lucrative black business in American history, uh, right. the Negro Leagues. Um, so we have a question in the chat from Jackie Hadley. Um, what are your thoughts on critical race theory and recommendations for addressing the current challenges we are facing educating the next generation about our black history? Well, you know, it's, I'm very interested in what's going on in Ukraine right now. And I think that, uh, I think that particularly those who are interested in critical race theory uh, and those who are interested in, um, in African American history should be concerned about, not concerned, but just should be interested in what's going on in Ukraine and the history of Ukraine and the history of, 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 of the act of, you know, we often see it in terms of the South will rise again. And we think of that and, and it does, when we see these flags and things of that sort, it does kind of make us think of some things, you know, it can put some fear in us. Um, but, you know, people are not satisfied with the way that the Civil War ended. People are, are, some people are really angry about that. Just like some Black people are really angry about the enslavement of their people. Some people really are angry that they don't feel like the federal government had the right to end slavery. And so that ideological war is not, has not ended. And it's not a coincidence that uh, you would find um, a movement even through policy and legislation, the same way that Black people were held captive here uh, through policy and legislation um, and rhetoric, political rhetoric and political ideology. Um, it's not a surprise that after the, the first Black president uh, that we, and after and as a result of the, I think I've heard, I heard, um, Al Sharpton said this one time. He said, if you fight the power, the power will fight you back. So don't get comfortable. I think that it has become a certain level of comfort that certain things won't happen, that we have arrived. And I think that that's problematic in the narrative of African-American history, because oftentimes the way African-American history is taught is that all of these negative things happened and the great Martin Luther King came and he knocked the bullies out and everything was so happy when integration happened and every racism went away and everything was, and then we had the first black president, oh my goodness, African-Americans have made it. But we don't realize that it's a, that that's not quite the reality on the ground. The reality on the ground is more like uh, what Al Sharpton said when he said, when you fight the power, the power fights you back. So we think that we're just comfortable and that freedom is just something and democracy and all of these things are just something that's guaranteed. Uh, no, that these things come with a fight and it's going to, and it's a fight that is ongoing. And I think that the critical race theory is similar to that, um, is similar uh, the, the the challenges to critical. People don't want you to study what, uh, what happened and, and how, and, and look critically at, at, at the racism in this country, that could mean, that, that would be politically disadvantageous to those who felt, um, um, who felt that their rights were imposed upon, that, that, their, that rights and freedom in America meant that they could discriminate. So this has always been a debate in America, and I think that people got comfortable for a while. We were on a smooth sailing. We felt really, really good for a while. Like we had really moved to a place that in reality we had not moved to. And so, because this is an ongoing fight. Um, and similarly, and I wanted to end this comment by going back to Ukraine, being a part of the Soviet Union at one time and, and, and Putin and Russia just never really happy with the way the Soviet Union came to an end and want to reclaim that. And people currently want to reclaim, they say this, they say this, that the South will rise again. That's not just somebody saying that. That is a realistic thought. That's a realistic um, act of, that's a self-declaration that this is a, a, a militaristic agenda. This was something, freedom came, uh, the quote unquote, the freedom that black people, that came by way of war. This is a serious thing. When you talk about black 
freedom and, and race and being able to critically analyze race. And I want to, on this one last point, I want to say this. Oftentimes, I would get a little frustrated uh, during the, uh, when Black people would get killed by police. I never felt like we were able to properly frame why it, this was, why it was a different thing than black on black crime. One of the reasons why it's different is because at one point in time, many times, for many years in this nation, black people could not testify against white people. Um, and so we didn't have the ability to have, to have anything critical to analyze or study to challenge our reality. And so people, wouldn't mind going back to that. People wouldn't mind going back to the days where Black people couldn't testify against whites in court, and they couldn't challenge what had been done to their bodies. They couldn't study, they couldn't read, uh, they couldn't write. It was illegal for them to do that. And so I think that this is a, this is a, we find tentacles from that uh, in this whole critical race theory debate. Excellent. Um, we have a question from Queen Sims. I think it's not really a question. Okay. We're not on that topic anymore. But I wanted to speak on the historical black colleges mm -hmm. and say that I live in Detroit. <clears throat> and we have an organization that does a tour of historically black colleges every year. We take the kids to all the historically black colleges. Wonderful. I went to Stillman, I, I made that comment. Alabama. And I was, just, and, uh, I was there when George Wallace was, was blocking my father worked for the railroad, so I rode for free. But he had to make sure one of his friends picked me up and kept me at his house until it was time to meet my train four hours later. So I continually tell the kids, it ain't what it seems like. Mm. Keep your eyes open. Don't take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. Because we don't exercise our powers. We take it for granted that somebody else is going to do it. Mm -hmm. And they just live in the moment. And I'm trying to get the young people that I deal with to understand. They can't wait till stuff happens. They have to work toward the peaceful side of things instead of jumping in when things get hot. Mm. And I'm sorry, I, I, but no. I preach on that all the time. That's wonderful. No, no reason to be sorry at all. That's that's great advice, Miss Sims. That's absolutely great. Yes. Just don't let our kids take our work for granted. That's yes. what I'm saying. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for to your organization and thank you for your perseverance and your triumph and just for representing HBCUs in our community so well. Just thank you. And I celebrate you and I commend you and your story. Thank you. Thank you for listening. You. Dr. Mago, we have one more question in the chat and we'll close with this. Um, uh, I read that, uh, I'm sorry. I've read that most graduates of HBCUs do not donate to their alma mater. Is that true? Oh, I do. Um, I would have to look more uh, at the statistics. Things have cha really changed within the past two or three years. Um, and, um, but yes, we do have a problem with alumni getting, but you know, it's so, it's, it's such a nuanced issue because, um, also, Black college graduates are more likely to have immense student loan debt. The majority of HBCU students uh, have, or have to receive uh, financial aid. The majority of them are first-time uh, students to my. I'm second generation, um, you know? Um, so it's such a nuanced issue. And, uh, and another part of that is I always think about uh, at Virginia State, 
we are like 20 minutes from VCU. And I I go, I go visit VCU often and I say, wow, what a wonderful institution. But it's so interesting that the that it was a purposeful decision to give VCU a medical school. These, these things that HBCUs not having a lot of medical schools and law schools and, 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 and graduate programs and large research programs, this was, this was not by coincidence. People in the boardroom decided how they were going to uh, give and divide up state funding and what institutions were going to have what. And, and they did make a decision that HBCUs would not have the same type of funding and the same type of resources that the white institutions would have. And so that really leads us to our alums. Now, I always, I say, I wonder what VCU alums are able to give because they have a large medical school and all of these things. I'm sure their alums probably could give a lot with no problem. They're medical doctors and, you know, they're engineers and all of these other specialties that they have. Uh, whereas at HBCUs, the number one programs that HBCUs have are education programs. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we're not, we know that educators, we don't, we don't get rich off what we do. And it's a reason why HBCUs have strong education departments and it relates directly back to slavery. Uh, it was determined that the, the number one thing that black people needed was an educate, was to teachers after slavery. So it was a priority to make HBCUs teachers institutions. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with that. My mom was a teacher. My, I, it was nothing wrong with that. But when it comes to uh, what alums are able to give back, because our institutions were uh, concerned and prioritized the training of the formerly enslaved, we had to focus on teachers, producing teachers. And while the other schools didn't have to focus on that. They can focus on getting their medical schools and their law schools and their engineering schools at a larger rate than at HBCU. So when we look at alumni giving, I don't think that the alums at HBCUs don't give because they don't want to give. I know I've sat in places many days and I wanted to give in my heart. I really did, but I just didn't have it. And I think that's been the story many times. So oftentimes, and then oftentimes in the black community, if you got one or two people that's been made it and got their graduate degrees, or as we say in Louisiana, they high, they high diplomas. We put it all together. <laughs> we say high school diplomas and put it all together. <laughs> say high diplomas in Louisiana. But, um, but they got their degree. They usually, if you have a breadwinner in the black community, that person is usually responsible. That's the go-to person that the whole family got to go to. To, to get get a few dollars to get their bills paid and, and, and to make sure such and such and go do this and, and we got to get our part because of the legacy of enslavement, the prop, our, we just not systematically, we not set up the same way as other people. Now, could we give more? Yes, we could. Yes, when I was, as soon as I left grandma, I set up a book scholarship, $100 I gave back to every year to my department. I set up a study and it grew as I grew. So could we all do that? Yes. Yes, we could. Could we do more? Yes, we could. But it is different though, because we are, we struggle more too. We struggle more too. And I know in our heart, we love our schools. We're not giving because we don't love our schools. Uh, it, for, but the people and some people do give and I'm happy for that. But we love our schools, but we just have so many, some, so many challenges sometimes that we just don't do it as much as we need to. So that's good at Claflin, that the alumni rate is, uh, given rate is 47%. Yes, okay. the generational Dr. Dr. Let Yellow, before you close out, I'd like to make a comment. Jack Absolutely, absolutely. Well, before you close out, I just wanna tip my hat off to you who we'll carry out this beautiful rest of the ceremony for us and hosting it up for us. And I also would like to thank you, Dr. Mingo, for did a beautiful job. Thank you. I have five of my siblings all finished the HBCUs, and uh, I probably would have went to one too when I retired from the Air Force, but 
I didn't have enough credits to get into school. So I went on and went to continue my life working at the post office at the military service. But I want to thank you so much. And I want to thank my museum educator, uh, Daniel Pittman. He's very humble. He's a super person. He's doing a great job pulling all these professors around the country to be, in our, be on our speaker's bureau here for this Black History Month. Thank you, Pittman. If you want to say something, please say something now and before, before we close out. So thank you all. And I want to thank our guests for coming on. I see a lot of Thomasville people on. Thank you all so much. Uh, Ms. Rivers up there and uh, Ms. Ms. Glory Flemings and the Hill family. And there might be other ones, but thank you all. You make me feel good. I hope Ms. Rivers is on. Uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, Sins up there in Detroit, Michigan. But uh, if she's not, we got to get her that this copy. But thank you all so much. Appreciate y'all. Y'all have a great, great week. And, and keep me in mind, the Black History Museum is here for you, for everyone. And uh, I think our <laughs> Black millionaires need to give more money. Yes. To the Historical yes. Black University. Yes. I, mean, yes. Now, I went to a Historical Black uh, College in Jacksonville, Florida, Ed Waters College for a year and a half. But when I got out the military, and moved to Northern Virginia, I couldn't afford Howard University. Mm -hmm. So I had to, uh, with my veterans money, I had to go to George Mason University and get my degree. Mm -hmm. But if oh. I had money, I'd give to the black universities. God just didn't give me the money. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> Thank you. I agree with that. It's only, we don't realize that it's only less, it's less than 110 HBCUs left, about 102. May I you say have something? over 200. They're closing their door. They. This is the last, besides the Black church, I know we closing, besides the, our Black religious institutions, HBCUs are the last major Black institution that we still have, that I argue, that did not dissipate. We cannot let them go. We got to support, this is this is what we have. We have to support these schools. They have done so much. They have supported us. They have supported us and we have to support them. So I agree. We need to, uh, people need to adopt these schools and, and we need to give to them. We do. The whole I, don't, I don't have a lot of money, but $500 a year is all I can give, but I give that's that a, $500 a year. That's significant. That is significant. Y'all don't, y'all don't beg enough. George Mason sent me a letter every year to give money. <laughs> Ed Waters College never sent me a letter to ask for money. That's a good point. That's a good point. I mean, we have to get out and beg for money. That's a good point. That is a great point. Because we can't let our historical black colleges disappear. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we have millionaires over in Africa. They can give money. Yes. Yes. Yes, I oh, agree. You can go to school. Exactly. I agree. Excellent point. 